Okay, today's date is 4 October 2023. I've got the pleasure of sitting down with Ralph Barrows. We are in Williamsburg, Virginia. So if you could just give us your name, uh, where you were born, where did you grow up, that kind of thing. My name is Ralph Barrows. I was born June 6, 1932 in Greenfield, Massachusetts. I was born and raised in, in Northfield, Massachusetts and uh, my association with the military really came about through going to the University of Massachusetts okay. at where I joined the uh, ROTC. I stayed in the ROTC for four years, graduated in 6 June 1932, 19, <laughs> 1932, 1954, and uh, that day I was sworn into both the Air National Guard and the Reserves the Air National Guard because the Air Force in 1954 didn't have enough space for all of the ROTC students that graduated that year. I was given orders to report to Stewart Air Force Base, New York, Newburgh, New York uh, in October. I reported in in October to uh, the Eastern Air Defense Force headquarters and by a couple days, I was senior to six other second lieutenants, all of whom, all of us were assigned to a reporting center there at the headquarters where that we received reports of unidentified flying objects and all over the eastern part of the United States and any reports possible that, that, uh, w that came up from unidentified submarines off of the east coast of the United States. Okay. And at that time, because of the Cold War, the Russians were operating submarines off the east coast that we knew of and were trying to keep track of them. But the most significant part of our reporting was, was trying to identify the, uh, the sources of the unidentified flying objects. In 1954, the B-52 was a reasonably new plane, mm -hmm. and of course at altitudes, and it was flying, say, 40 to 50,000 feet, it was with the swept wings, it looked like it was a round sphere flying across the sky, and people weren't familiar with it. So B-47s and B-52s uh, probably inspired a lot of the reports and we would check those through SAC headquarters before we called the Rock uh, in Colorado Springs uh, where all of our reports went. The other, the other part which was most unusual was the uh, CIA and the military were experimenting with skyhook balloons at that time. The skyhook balloon was a, a balloon, plastic balloon, that uh, was inflated on the ground was about 125 feet in length, but when it got to 60,000 feet altitude, it was a sphere, round, silver looking, rotating, and it carried a 400 pound uh, node, 400 pounds of equipment in a node in the center. So it actually looked like a flying saucer. Those were released at the west coast and flew across the United States and it was an experiment that was to be used flying across Russia to gain uh, intelligence. When it got to the East Coast, uh, interestingly enough, F-86s from our base there at Stewart Air Force Base would go up and shoot it down as soon as the balloons got to the coast. During my period of time at Stewart, uh, my boss, Colonel Aramis Dutillion, decided that I was possible military experience, uh, military career material and decided that I should go to tech school. And he made arrangements for me to go to Stewart Air Force Base in, uh, to uh, Shepard Air Force mm -hmm. Base in Texas to photo interpretation school, which I did. I was down there for nine months. Following the nine months in school, I was assigned to the 47th Bomb Wing 
in Sculthorpe in England. And this was a tech, tactical bomb wing with first B-45s and then B-66s. It was the first and only nuclear capable force that we had in NATO at the time in Europe. My responsibility was to build with a team T2A trainer plates. These were to go in ultrasonic trainers and to help navigators find their targets and their off and their uh, off the uh, the uh, anyway on their on their bomb runs. The once a month, possibly most unusual thing that I did, once a month I was the tactical officer that I sat in a tent with three nuclear weapons which would be assigned to the B-45s if, if we had a, uh, a, a nuclear, if we had a, an emergency where that we had to actually load bombs and so forth. And that was a, a kind of a hairy experience. After leaving, after three years in, uh, in Skullthorpe, I would return to Texas, back to Shepard Air Force Base. Okay. I was assigned as an instructor in the school. And when I arrived at the school, they decided that with my experience that I should be working on a small scale key for photo interpreters to use in the future when we finally got to the stage where that there was overhead imagery available. So for about six months, I worked with U2 imagery and special optics, building a, a, a small scale interpretation key for the Air Force. After that period of time and teaching some in between, uh, I was assigned to go to Squadron Officer School in, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And the following the, following the Montgomery, Alabama, I was, I was sent, went back to Texas and uh, with the experience of, the, of going through the Squadron Officer School, I was assigned as a Squadron Officer Squadron Commander, and I was actually a commander of two squadrons at the same time. 750 TDY NCOs in engine schools there at, uh, in, in Texas, and 350 TDY NCOs in mobile detachments worldwide. I did that for about uh, a year plus, and then I was assigned to, uh, moved from, from Texas, assigned to uh, the 17th Bomb Wing, so I can take that back. My first, my first tour in Southeast Asia, I was given assignments to go to the Military Assistance Group in Bangkok, Thailand, and, and as a matter of fact, took my family with me. And we lived in Bangkok, and I worked at Dom Muang with a team of four other people, and we were assigned in Dom Wong to the headquarters of the Royal Thai Air Force with the intention and, and direction of building an intelligence division for the Royal Thai Air Force. We wrote regulations and we wrote directives and we gave lectures and we spent a lot of time training the people. But possibly the most interesting jobs that I had were not necessarily attached to my assignment. I worked with the embassy and people from AID, American International Development, on putting together programs and packages which we took to upcountry locations to fight the insurgency 
which was going on in the upcountry part of Thailand. And they were really concerned about, uh, the government was really concerned about that. And, uh, and, I, and I, the, the places that we went were, many of them, were places where that CB units, and there were three CB units operating in Thailand at the time, were building new airstrips. PSP was the, was the uh, surface that we landed on. But anyway, in many cases, we, we went in a, in a C-47, and we were the first airplane to ever land on these new airstrips that the, that the uh, CBs were building. The, uh, anyway, that was, that was interesting. And then, in my spare time, I put together lectures for the professional schools, the Air Command and Staff School, and the juniors, junior suit officer schools uh, there in Thailand and the Royal Thai Air Force. Possibly the most interesting, the most fun job that I had there was spending some time with the officers that were going to the states for schools. And we, we would sit and spend some hours talking about colloquial English so that the guys, when they went into bars and or were doing, were spending time socially, they wouldn't understand what some of the colloquial mm. American language concerned. Anyway, back to, uh, back to the United States, I went to, uh, ordered to go to 17th Bomb Wing in Wright-Patterson. And uh, I, I signed into the, in, on the way, during the period of time that uh, between the time that I was gave the orders to go to Wright-Patterson and got there, there were some people that were trying d desperately to get me transferred to California to work on the U-2 programs. However, I didn't want to go to California and or whatever. We signed in at Wright-Patterson and I was frozen there as an assignment at least to begin. Right. At Wright-Patterson, I was responsibility, my responsibility was to build bomb run inserts for B-52s, it was the E model, and uh, for bomb wing, and these were uh, radar, we didn't do radar predictions, but we did radar, uh, for the, we did bomb run inserts both for the navigators and the radar navigators, is what I wanted to say. Okay. And the, uh, started out really well. For several months I was going, the, uh, doing, building the materials all right. And then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue sky, they decided that I had to go back to Southeast Asia and I was given a, uh, an assignment to an Air Sector Operations Center at Udorn. I was picked to go to Udorn because there were no permanent facilities at all, and they just opened this ASOC as an emergency. And uh, I could do both the air intelligence side, the target side, I could be Air intelligence officer, targets officer, and of course I'm a photo interpreter, so that any imagery that was brought in from from the RB66s and so forth to the ASOC, I could do the imagery interpretation as well and the targeting. So in December, I guess it was September of 19. I can't remember. Is the this pre-Vietnam War? Yes. So before the war, it was war involvement. It, it it was it was warming up. Okay. Actually, the the effort that we had at uh, at Udorn was to support Vang Pao. Vang Pao was the general in charge of the free Cambodians that were fighting the Vietnamese and the Plain de Jars. Okay. And uh, it it was a. It, it was a crazy war to start and a crazy war throughout, of course. But anyway, we were, we were flying 
T-28s, loading bombs on T-28s, but the T-28s came from our side, from, from American bases in Thailand with Thai, with, uh, Thai indic markings on the airplane. And they'd fly over to Vientiane, and at Vientiane they would pull out the plates out of the tail and the wings and, and change the imagery, change the markings on the airplane to Laotian markings. And then they would go drop the bombs or do the, do the uh, reconnaissance or whatever over the plane of jars. And we were also putting together at, uh, at the ASOC, we were putting together packages to take to and drop for the Mongs, H-M-O-N-G, the Mongs. <laughs> These are the native free fighters that were fighting the Vietnamese in villages all over. So, so they're using well, trainers, the trainers to drop bombs. We were using, actually we were using, the, the principal airplane used for that was an inline, 12-cylinder 12 in, 12 inline Swedish plane. Okay. Swiss plane. Yeah, okay. Anyway, very unique, and, uh, but it was a short takeoff and landing aircraft, had to be. Because they were dropping, they were they were flying into fields. Right. Yeah. No airfields, but they were flying into not plowed fields, but but anyway, grass fields. At the end of this three or four month period, they finally the CBs were in there, and they were finally oh, during this period of time, I was living in the fourth floor of the One One Hotel in downtown Udorn with Air America pilots. Mm -hmm. And the CIA was very active there and had a series of, well, it was the CIA planes that were taking the packages into the, to the uh, native Vietnam, the native Cambodians. Right. And uh, I got to know quite a few of the, of the, uh, Air America pilots, and they're the craziest people <laughs> I have ever met. I mean, they were all Romanians and whatever. They all and they all spoke Russian. Right. Anyway, after three or four months of that time, they finally decided they had built enough facilities, enough permanent barracks facilities, so that they could put in two or three people, which were authorized, and they sent me home to the 17th Bomb Wing. Worked there the 17th Bomb Wing for another about six months and uh, built a new set of uh, bomb run inserts for the, as we got new targets and uh, new sets of, of targets for training. And I actually had my family down on the coast of, of uh, Massachusetts, down in Cape Cod, when a person came running out to the beach one day and said, uh, Mr. Barrows, get on the phone right now and call your headquarters. Uh, it's an emergency. So I did. I was given two and a half days to report to Eglin number nine in Florida because I had been handpicked to lead the photo interpretation section for the introduction of ground sensors into the Vietnamese War, Vietnamese War at uh, Task Force Alpha in the Con Phnom. Can I, can I stop you real quick? Well, so you mentioned several times bomb run insert. What, yeah. what is that? It's, it's target materials. Okay. The bomb run inserts were, the, were the, the target materials that were in packages that uh, with all of, the, all of the offset and target information, okay. with all of the location, description, and measurements okay. for the navigators and the radar navigators to use to bomb their targets. Okay. Locate and bomb their targets. And these were um, very intricate, very delicate materials to put together. They were put together with uh, really a fine tooth comb 
and uh, the measurements, for instance, for the offsets were within inches rather wow. than feet. And this, these are continually updated, I guess, as the intelligence comes in, they would have to develop a new package and... Actually, in, in the development of the offsets and the targets, every once in a while, while I was at Wright-Patterson, they would fly me to 8th Air Force up in, at Westover, mm. and I would be given uh, both, you, both with overset, over, overhead imagery to look, look at okay. and use the overhead imagery in the identification of both targets. The best points for the targets for the most destruction and, okay. and, the, and the best offsets for selection of offsets okay. for, for the bomb runs. Yeah, it, it, uh, and, a, and an anecdote along those lines, because of my, my uh, special clearances, I was not allowed to go to Russia for some years after, not only just after military, but after I, I worked for a defense contractor afterwards. And seven years after all of this work, why I was finally cleared that I could go to Russia mm -hmm. and, uh, and did so on a, on a cruise ship. And we went up to St. Petersburg and got off the ship and, uh, and on a bus rode into St. Petersburg. And the first thing we did was pass a very large aluminum factory there at the, in the, uh, on the bay. And I looked at it and I just turned to my wife and I said, you take a look at that. <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> right. Of course, it was, one, it was at one time one of our targets. Yeah. But anyway. So they didn't, want, they didn't want the Russians getting what was up here. That's right. <laughs> anyway, and as, as we traveled around St. Petersburg, I said, yeah, I've, I've seen that before and I've seen that before. Right. But anyway, that the, uh, so we went to, went to Florida and got trained on uh, how that the operation was going to do, how that, how that the, the uh, sensors were going to be dropped. There were two principal sensors that, that were involved in the ground sensor program. One was called an ADSID. And, and I can't give you the, the name, the actual name, name of it, although it's, it's in that report I gave you. The uh, ADSID was one that was dropped from different altitudes and actually stuck in the ground. Okay. And it was, it was, an, it was a uh, sensor that detected both truck and, and uh, vehicular and uh, people walking, traffic, at different distances, obviously. And then there was another sensor called the Aquaboy, which was one with, that dro was dropped with a parachute and would hang up in the uh, triple canopy. Uh, and we would try to use those in, in dropping them near truck parks and so forth when there was a lot of activity. Okay. Anyway, this was all of this, and we would drop the, the ADSIDs, those sensors in strings of four, and so that we could detect movement of trucks down roads or whatever yeah. and 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 drop them in in areas of fours again on known roads and paths where the, the troops were actually walking okay. anyway that's that's a part of the story anyway so in september uh, 1967 went to Task Force Alpha and for three months I had five lieutenants, four lieutenants and three sergeants, all trained, good trained PIs. And that was my team. We did a lot of analysis of intelligence from every source available on where the traffic, where the most traffic was coming through Laos into South Vietnam, both truck traffic and, and uh, traffic on foot. And for a couple months, we analyzed it. We went down to the Ricky Tech in uh, Saigon and got maps and imagery. And with the maps and imagery, then we started planning where the sensors were gonna be dropped. 
we had uh, initially we had uh, Navy support. The Navy had uh, P2V aircraft that had been used in World War II for dropping the uh, dropping Aquaboy sensors in the water to detect submarines and or uh, merchant uh, or surface aircraft uh, surface ships. And so they were equipped with racks that went on the wings that could that we modified to drop the ADSID and and we used them as well for dropping the Aquaboys. So we had two P two Vs at the Con Panam for doing that. Uh, the problem was the it wasn't they big it was a big aircraft. 17, I believe 17 in the crew. Big aircraft travel slow. Actually worked pretty good in our tests, uh, but soon after the first of the year, the Vietnamese, of course, figured out these big aircraft were dropping something, and they put some 37 millimeter air anti-aircraft in, introduced them into Laos and it became too dangerous for them mm -hmm. to, to fly. So we changed from the P2Vs to F4s that were located at Ubon. Uh, my responsibility again, once we had planned where the sensors were gonna go, uh, I briefed all of the crews on what altitude, what direction, where the sensors were to go, where their, uh, their, their pickle off points were, and so mm -hmm. forth. And uh, that worked pretty good. We got, the, we got the crews involved and so forth. And after about uh, maybe a half a dozen sorties, we figured there was something wrong. We couldn't analyze. We weren't getting good data from where we thought the sensors were and the activity that we were seeing that were on the, on the roads and we had to go back and have the ballistics redefined by the people down at Eglin number nine. Fixed the system and saved it. This is a three billion dollar, the most expensive experimental system <laughs> ever, ever devised for use in the US military. But anyway, but we made the system uh, work. About Christmas time of the year, Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese surrounded Khe Son, a uh, big marine base just south of the 17th parallel. And uh, the commander at, uh, at Saigon came up and asked if, there was, if, he, if we thought there was any way that we could help in the defense. I flew down in helicopter down to Khe Son and spent some time with the, the uh, Marines down there and we planned, gave them some sensors and they actually implanted, by digging holes, planted sensors around the perimeter of Quezon to detect the gooks were trying to tunnel underneath the, the, uh, the uh, perimeters of Quezon. So we used them to uh, detect the, the uh, tunneling and places around in the, in the forest areas around Quezon where that they were using for assembly areas and we bombed those very effectively. I used to sit at the, at the big board in, uh, in Task Force Alpha. We had a big board where we had uh, all of the sensors that, that had been implanted and we had uh, if this activity, the sensor sends a signal to a relay aircraft, the relay aircraft sends a sensor, uh, sends that signal to an antenna over Task Force Alpha, which sends the signal down to a computer. The computer forwards the sensor to, to a light on our, on our board. And I could tell, for instance, if there was movement in a string of sensors, one, two, three, four, meant a truck was moving south through that sensor string. Well, we, we had the same thing operating outside of the of Quezon, and I could sit there 
and I had an HF radio on my <laughs> connection with the with the uh, people at, at uh, the Marine Base in, in Quezon, and I could say, Major, I got a I got a report of such and such a sensor. He says, Yeah, Roger, I got you. And now I got this and then this. And about that time, he'd say, Okay, we're taking action. And he'd have he'd have the Marine artillery put put shells on those sensors on those coordinates. And it was really kind of fun. I mean, you talk about real time right. real time intelligence. Yeah, we we had some real time intelligence. Anyway, at the end of that. I went back to uh, back to the the 17th bomb wing again, building bomb run inserts, and uh, at the end of that time, uh, it was time it was time for me to move on, and I was assigned as a because because I I was assigned then to DIA first, and I worked as a photo interpreter for DIA for a week, and then by telephone I was transferred to headquarters Air Force, uh, headquarters in, in uh, the headquarters Air Force Intelligence Division in, uh, in, the, in the Pentagon. And because of my experience with the ground sensor program, I was assigned as a special assistant to the deputy chief of staff headquarters USF. And I was assigned to a special task force with a plan to design and deploy a new family of all weather sensors, which would further automate the battlefield. And since the ground sensor program was one that was already in the field and successful why it was to play an important role in mm -hmm. this thing. I worked for probably six or eight months uh, with this special task force. Then I went back to my job in the, in the headquarters. Mm -hmm. And my job in the headquarters was to be in charge of a team that was putting together 750 million dollar program to build a tactical information and a tactical intelligence processing and information system tippy system for tactical forces and this system was to be in three parts a photo interpretation section a data automation section and a intelli and a electronic intelligence section three different mm -hmm. devices. I uh, worked on that, uh, that development with industry and with uh, visiting tactical forces to determine what their specific requirements were. And uh, the TIPI system evolved over a fairly long period of time. And I get to that uh, much, l much later. But anyway, the TIPI system uh, was uh, under development long after, long after I left. While I was there, I became, I was a lieutenant colonel at the time, and I became eligible for senior service school. And uh, this is a funny story too. It was a time when the Air Force was short of, funny, of money. So there were several of us that were there in Washington. We said, we agreed that we signed a, even signed a piece of paper and said, we'll go to school right here in Washington and you won't have to transfer our family to anywhere and we'll take whatever assignment that you give us following the completion of the senior service school, we'll stay right here and it'll, tra it'll save two PCS transfer. Yeah. Well, that was all right, I, and they accepted that. And the list came out and the general who was in charge of uh, the list at the time, 
in Texas, San Antonio. He found that there was some favoritism somewhere along the line, so he said, throw out the list and do it again. Well, this sergeant up on the fifth floor of the Pentagon, uh, he had already told me that I was going to be at, at the school in Washington. He called up and said, that's, that's all out. I don't know where you're going, but, but anyway, there'll be a new list here pretty soon. He called up about a month later and said, uh, Colonel, I think you ought to come up right now. And I went up and I said, what's the bad news? And he said, it's not bad news. He said, you're going to Rome. Rome meant Rome, Italy, to the NATO Defense College in Rome. I was two Air Force, there were two Air Force, two Army, two Marine, two Navy, and two State Department. People were selected to go to each of three classes in the NATO Defense College in Rome, and you would be there for seven months. Okay. That was a piece of cake. I mean, uh, being in Rome, Italy, was really nice. And as part of my assignment, I was to go to Stuttgart, Germany for three and a half years following the uh, seven months in Rome. So I did, and got to Stuttgart, Germany, and I was assigned as a staff officer, and then eventually the chief of intelligence, intel, uh, intelligence planning branch, U.S. European Command Headquarters. And as a member of the staff of the Special Assistant to the Commander in Chief, I directed and or participated in major studies to improve intelligence support to Allied Command Europe throughout integration of tactical, theater, and national intelligence systems. Anyway, it's a fancy term, but it was a very, very important and, and a really interesting job because I was in contact with intelligence officers, intelligence units, of all of the tactical and national units throughout Europe, actually almost throughout NATO. And the, uh, uh, some of the jobs that I had there were, were really interesting. For instance, from time to time, and this wasn't monthly, but from time to time I would fl they would fly me into Berlin. Couldn't go by train, but I could go in by, f by, mm -hmm. by plane. They would fly me into Berlin and I would meet with representatives of the MLM, and you may or may not be familiar with that. MLM is the Military Liaison Mission, and these were officers and NCOs that were intelligence people who drove around in armored cars, and they would go through Checkpoint Charlie at night, and they would drive around East Berlin and East Germany collecting intelligence at night, sometimes with very hairy experiences, but anyway, they would escape one way or another. And from time to time, I would go up there and, and get debriefed. That would, I would debrief them and uh, use some of the intelligence in plans, in our plans. But the, uh, one of, the other, one of the other jobs that was, was really fun was uh, quarterly I would fly up to Mons, Belgium and uh, brief the commander of NATO on intelligence activities and or enemy activities in the uh, NATO area. And it was a special treat when uh, Alexander Haig took over as uh, commander of NATO. He was uh, an interesting, brilliant, and uh, a lot of fun person to, to brief, and that, and that really was a treat. Following that, I was assigned at, uh, actually I used to go to, to some of the bases to talk with other intelligence people, and one of my friends was the uh, 
the intelligence officer in charge of uh, the tactical unit at uh, Ramstein, Germany, and full colonel. And he was uh, reassigned as uh, director of intelligence, a director, uh, yeah, the, intel the director of intelligence at headquarters TAC at Langley Air Force Base. Okay. And the, uh, when he got back to TAC, why he contacted me and said, when you get reassigned, I'd like to have you come and be my director of intelligence systems here at TAC. And uh, so when the time came for me to, uh, at, and this was in 1979, early 79, when it was time for me to go back to, uh, to the States, why I was reassigned as the director of intelligence systems in uh, attack. And what was interesting there is I was seeing Tippy, which I was responsible for years before, Tippy units, Tippy elements out in tactical forces. Some of them in the form that we had originally designed, most of them in, in modified forms or parts of, of the forms, but anyway, it was a, it was uh, it was rewarding to see that things that I had been associated with and worked with years before mm -hmm. were being used out in the tactical forces, and the uh, I had a staff then of about uh, 33 and uh, responsibility over about a thousand people in tactical forces uh, there at TAC. And then in 1979, I was appointed as the position of Deputy Chief of Staff Intelligence. I moved up to that position where that I was responsible for all of the operations of the tactical, of the, of the command, of the headquarters of the command, and different responsibilities of management and responsibility over now 1,400 people through the tactical forces. and. The uh, and once a month, oh yeah, once a week, not once a month, once a week, I would uh, put together a special briefing, intelligence briefing, and go over and, and brief the uh, the commander of TAC. And in December of 1980, I retired. As a colonel. And happily. <laughs> <laughs> but the, part of the reason why that I retired. Uh, was it was, I was still young enough so, and with my experience, I was still uh, young enough to be attractive to the, the companies looking for military experience. And I was hired by Science Applications International Corporation immediately uh, and uh, given job I opened up, uh, as a matter of fact, within uh, oh, a, a number of months. I worked, I worked in, 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 the in the location of the uh, Virginia Beach location for a period of time, and then they asked me to open up a shop in, uh, at, in uh, uh, Hampton. And I opened up two contracts with mm -hmm. at uh, with the Recutech at uh, Langley, and that bloomed from the operation in Hampton went from me to two to five to before when I when I finally quit SAIC, why uh, there were about uh, two thousand people working in, in intelligence type of activities yeah. on the peninsula yeah. and dip from different places. So, but anyway, one of my jobs in SAIC was in 1985, I was asked to be a uh, work with the special forces in Korea. And I flew over there and it was really rewarding to see that the special forces people in Korea were using some of the tactical equipment, particularly the electronic side equipment, 
that was a modification of what we developed in Tiffy right. years before. So it's a it's a it's a chain. Yeah. And it's a but anyway. Let me touch on that real quick. So you were in the service during the golden age of the Air Force. Um, it was the best years. Early, early 50s, you know, all the way through the 70s. It what what kind of, what were the major changes that you saw from the time you got in to the time you retired? What stands out the most? Possibly the, ad of the attitude of the people, the dedication of the people to not just the Air Force, but the military. People now don't have the, I, I don't want to say dedication. I don't think, I don't think they have, I don't, they just, they just don't have the attitude that we had. Work uh, ethic maybe? Uh, they, maybe the ethics. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the desire to do everything right and well and, and uh, I, I think they, they don't think of it as, as a as a dedication, it's more of just a job. Right. To income. And and that's really sad. Um, no, I was I'm I I think about that quite a lot. Yeah. When I when I see what's going on and I read read the problems, we never we never had the the actually we did not have problems with the uh, uh, Color. We had fewer fewer colored people in the service, but I had colored I had colored NCOs working for me. Almost every place that I that I had. And and the other people that were in the divisions, it was the color was never questioned. It was they were, everybody was treated the same. Yeah. And that's not true today. Yeah. Uh, I had females. Not many, but a few. You, you see a lot more females now. But there was no question of, of, of people making fun of them or, or saying bad things around them. We never had that problem. No, it's, it, the things have changed, yeah. and not necessarily for the better, yeah. which did is you, sad. Did you ever have any bad experiences as a result of your time in Vietnam? A lot, a lot of, a lot of guys came back, and they had a lot of bad experiences. Did you ever have any of that? My favorite nephew, who I just visited last week, quit school. I went, I went to, I went to Vietnam the first, first first time in, in, well, it was 1967. He quit college with one semester to go to walk in demonstrations in the streets of Boston demonstrating against the Vietnam War. And right now he's my favorite nephew, <laughs> but at the time that was pretty tough to take. Yeah. yeah. When I got when I got back, there were there were family members that asked me why I stayed in, why I went to Vietnam. What a bad mistake it was, and I won't say that I didn't agree with some of the things with, that we did, yeah. but uh, nevertheless, that was a decision made by somebody yeah. higher than me, yeah. and, uh, and we did what we were asked to do, and tried to do it right, and tried to do it well. Yeah. That's, uh, what is your most memorable experience about your time in Vietnam? Good or bad? It's the thing that sticks out the most when you think back on it. When we when we were at, I was at Udorm. When I was in Bangkok, my wife and I went to the Catholic Church in Bangkok, and the Catholic Church in Bangkok was manned by a rotating group of priests, some of whom, some of whom where we were assigned to a school in northern part of Thailand, actually near about 30, 40 miles from Udorn. 
So, and I got to know the priests. So when I was at Udorn, well, I went to the commander and I said, not far from here is a school of about 220 Thai kids that are run, this, the, the school is run by the Catholic Church. And, uh, and I said, is there any possibility that I can get together a couple Jeeps and we put together some canned goods or whatever and, and, uh, and take them up to the school? We could do better than that, the commander did. Actually, we had a, we had a, a parade of about five trucks and I mean, people donated money, they donated all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I called the priest, got, got together with the priest, and said that we are coming on a certain day. And as we approached, those 220 kids lined the street outside the gate in their white uniforms you can imagine what, I mean, from here to, to there, you can imagine what that looked like. You're coming around the corner and seeing 220 little people standing out there welcoming us because we were doing something. I said, that was, that was probably the most moving thing that I had done during my period of time over there. Yeah. Anyway. Something good. Yeah, something good. Let's go back in time to your early days of the Air Force. You talked about UFOs earlier. What was the Air Force's default position on that? Did, did they on what on on these reports of UFOs? Did the Air Force assume oh, that all of these oh. were explainable, or were they open to the fact that it might be something? Didn't didn't even didn't even try. Didn't even try. There was the the press really hadn't discovered it. And that, which was which was really good. The uh, yeah, we once in a while we would have a a report, not something something that we absolutely could not excuse by a B forty seven B fifty two or the Skyhook, and and with the type of of movement and whatever. Yeah, there were those reports, and those reports were just buried in in the mountain. Right. No, we, there wasn't. There wasn't anything. But but like I said, the press at that time um, wasn't a big thing. Yeah. Which was good, good for us. Yeah. Right. W were any of those reports could they be explained by the Russians? Because you, you mentioned you also did the U the submarines. There, there were, were the Russians actually flying over. No, we didn't have Russians flying okay. over. Okay. No, the. Uh, we did, the Russians did fly their TU whatever along the coast. Yeah. Uh, we, we knew of those, but they didn't, they didn't penetrate our airspace. Uh, there were times when we knew where there, there were Russian submarines off the coast. And uh, if there was a report from a fisherman or whatever, professional fishermen and or amateur fishermen that came to us, we would send uh, helicopters out looking for, trying to determine, and, and we found we found Russian yeah. submarines out there. But sometimes the, the report would be simple as a, uh, a log off the coast, right. floating by at, an, at a distance, unidentified, and uh, and we and we would determine those two. Sometimes we spent a lot of time and some money trying to trying to track these things down. But most of the time, for our for our uh, the unidentified flying objects, we would either track it to the people who were flying the the uh, Skyhook balloons, and those were maybe once a month or once every two months. It would not often, and we would always know when they were flying because they would let the uh, the headquarters know because eventually they would want the F-86 to go up and shoot it down. So we would get advance notice of that. But the B-52s and 47s, SAC was pretty good in working with us on that. And, uh, and there were a, a lot of reports 
because the aircraft were new yeah. and they were flying at altitude and the B-52s probably had a ceiling of, I don't know, maybe 53, 54,000, but they would be flying between 40 and 50,000. And up there, depending upon the atmosphere, they look round. Yeah. yeah. Right. What, what, you mentioned the skyhook balloons. What, yeah. what, what, what are those? What's well, the it, was, it, was, it was to be an intelligence collection device. Okay. Actually, it was, it was cylindrical on the ground, but once it got up, why, because of the pressure, why all of that went, it, it, okay. it made it a, a, a round cylinder with a 400 pound black node or dark node because of the collection equipment. I don't know that they had cameras in, in the devices going over, but at least they had the weight in there, the same weight that, that the actual balloons would call it. So the, uh, so the, the and they were, just, they were just detecting how, the, how fast the balloons would fly how high they would go, and they would go up to about 60,000. So they really looked like an air, except they moved very slowly. Yeah. They looked they look like an unidentified flying object. Right. And, uh, and we could track them, because we'd get the reports going across. <laughs> right. Um, what, somebody might watch this interview decades down the road. What, what would you like them to know about your service? I loved it. The hard part was the, the remote tour that was a year long. I understand, I understand people that have families that have problems with remote tours. Yeah. My son at that time was uh, seven, eight years old, and Barbara had to be mother and father. And when I came back, it took some months before my son and I were really close friends again. And interestingly, I told you that we were actually, I was actually called off the beach at Cape Cod to go to uh, this assignment at, at uh, Eglin number nine. My son would never go back to Cape Cod for any reason because he lost his father in a, in a message when he was at Cape Cod and he just, he just didn't, didn't ever want to go back there. So it's, 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 you know, it affects people. Yeah. I don't think people understand the sacrifice that the families make as well. We always focus on the service men and women, yeah. but their families make a huge sacrifice. Actually, uh, it was a sacrifice too. I didn't realize it at the time. My first assignment to, to the MAG in, uh, in Bangkok, we were, you have to understand, w this was 1962. 1962 in Bangkok is a city of two million people with the widest street two lanes paved clones on either side. They did rebuild Bangkok in between 50 and 72 and 75 because they were going to have the Asian Games there. So they put the clones underground and they widened the streets. But I was located in a, we were located in a, in a compound just north of Bangkok. And it was about 10 miles to MAG headquarters in, down, in downtown Bangkok. And it would take me more than a half an hour to go at any given time because of the traffic right. in, in uh, two million people, uh, like I said. In, and they, they had just gotten rid of the rickshaws, but they had, <laughs> they had other instruments for pe moving people around that were just as bad as the rickshaws. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, uh, yeah, and we, were li we lived in a place we, we live in a house, no air conditioning. Uh, everything you did, you had to, had to use uh, bottled water. Uh, no running water uh, in the afternoons. If it rained, and it rained a lot, it meant no telephones. Uh, 
not easy, not easy for families to live. We lived in we lived in a relatively new house. We had uh, three poisonous snakes in the house in the in the year that we were there, two years, and uh, it it uh, yeah it was it was hazardous, but we got we got through it, and uh, my wife lost some weight, <laughs> <laughs> but but we survived. Right. <laughs> Actually, I I enjoyed. The assignment, because we were we were very successful in working with the tacticals, the uh, with the ties. They really appreciated what we were doing for them, and we had some good people that we were working with. And uh, my jobs with the with the, uh, the the work that I did with with the embassy and AID working up country, uh, we really think we did. Good work there too, in encountering the the the, uh, yeah. the bad guys. Yeah. So that's if you're successful, yeah. why you're happy. Yep. <laughs> Looking back on your service, how do you think, especially your war, your wartime service, how do you think that uh, affected the person that you became, the person you are now? Probably more appreciative of what what we have right here. Uh, I've seen so much of, of, I've been to places where people needed so much. Not just food, but they needed organization, they needed direction, they needed help. And, and uh, you, any one of the places in Thailand, places, the Vietnam was a mess, uh, Cambodia, Laos. All of those places, uh, they all need help, and uh, it really makes me appreciate what we have here. Yeah. Last question: Advice you would give a young person? Well, if if it had been ten years ago, I'd say the military is a great career. The military right now is a kind of a shaky career, but it's but it's I think still a good career. It was, it was a good career for me. And that's why I say 27 years. Yeah. The, uh, a lot of people stay in for 20 years and, and figure that that's, uh, that's enough. I, I got out because, really selfishly, because it was the right time for me to convert to, and I worked for 11 years for a defense contractor because I had something to offer. And, uh, but uh, otherwise, maybe I would have stayed longer. Yeah. Well, 27 years is a long time. <laughs> yeah, but if you're having fun. <laughs> right. And, and like I said, my wife was with me 10 years overseas. Of course, the two years in Bangkok was kind of tough. But uh, three and a half years in Stuttgart, Germany was wonderful. Seven months in Rome was great. Three years in, in England. Uh, and and my son David was born when we were yeah. in Sculthorpe in England. And the, yeah. the, uh, it was so it was good. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't talked about you want to you want to you want to document? So. Nope. All right. Well, on behalf of the Americans of Wartime Experience, sir, thank you for sitting down and talking to us. It was great doing it. Yep. And uh, more importantly, thank you for your service to your country. Thank you very much. Thank you.